Back in part two of the course, we looked at Aristotle's theory of virtue. And we now we turn to look at Aristotle's theory of virtue in terms of moral education. The background for Aristotle remains the same. Obviously, still the student of Plato, teach Alexander the Great. And of course, when I last checked, he's still dead. Aristotle is an important figure for moral education because of his lasting, enduring influence, and many would say imitation today. If you've looked at various um, you know, self-help books or advice books about how to develop habits or how to achieve success, many of them will simply replicate what Aristotle said thousands of years ago, which is hardly surprising given that although you know, our technology has changed, et cetera, now have the internets and the Facebooks, uh, humans have not changed in a significant way. So what worked back in Aristotle's day would still work today. And so in a way, this is kind of a uh, budget, I guess, self-improvement advice. And Aristotle gives the basics that you, you would see in a book or course you might pay you know, considerably for. So let's take a look at his habit and virtue. He begins by looking at a good starting question, which is, what is human nature? Because if you're going to decide how to bring about moral education, if you should do it and how to do it, you need to know, are people born good, bad, or neutral? Aristotle's approach is that people are born neutral. So developing these moral virtues is not contrary to nature. So we're not born, you know, bad without you know, difficulty becoming virtuous. But he also believes they're not born good with a natural, you know, ability to be good. But he does think that it's natural to actually receive virtue. So in the most part, we would say that people would be tending to be born, born neutral. Aristotle is aware that people do have certain you know, tendencies. For some people, certain things are easier, like generosity or courage. Some things are harder. But his view is, is that we have to develop them. No one is born you know, fully virtuous or fully full of vice. And he draws a comparison between the virtues and other qualities we have. So in the case of virtues, we acquire their potentialities you know, first, we, ha we have the potential to develop them and later actualize them. In Aristotle's metaphysics, he develops these notions of potentiality and actuality. And keeping it fairly simple, because we're not doing metaphysics, is the following. So as you might guess, potentiality is, means what you normally think it mean. It is that you don't have that quality or feature or ability, but you could. You know, if someone is not generous, they have the potential to become generous or greedy. And then actualization is exactly what you think it would be. It's to go from potentially being something to, well, actually being that. And this is part of Aristotle's metaphysics. He believed that you know things have potentiality and they're actualized by features of metaphysics. Boom, we won't get into, into that in, in any depth. In the case of our other qualities, for example, our, our senses, assuming you know, someone is born and you know, eyes are uh, developed and you know, hearing developed, et cetera, we have them and they just hopefully just work from the start. We don't have to you know, go from potentiality to actuality. I mean, we, we get better, obviously, at you know, recognizing things and understanding things. But they pretty much work from the, assuming everything's going well, they work from the get-go. The virtues, though, work differently, according to Aristotle. And he draws an analogy, and he likes analogies, and most philosophers do, to the arts. So in the case of the arts, we are not born with the, you know, the full actuality. So for example, like Jimi Hendrix didn't, wasn't born in such that they you know, handed him a guitar and immediately started playing, obviously. And again, people can have certain you know, natural talents and abilities that make things easier or qualities that make it harder, but we have to learn these things by doing them. So people will become architects by doing architecture, guitar players by playing guitar, they become you know, artists by drawing, etc. And Aristotle says that virtue works in an analogous way. How do you become just? By performing just acts. How do you become generous? By performing generous acts. How do you become brave? By performing brave acts. Basically, you become what you repeatedly do, which is sort of the core advice to you know, 
pretty much any sort of credible self-improvement claim, they essentially say what you do is if you want to become something, you just keep doing that. And that's the, the basis of it, you know, just you know, that's the foundation and the core. The rest is kind of window dressing in terms of other stuff. So that's the core of Aristotle's view that you become by doing. But of course, he keeps keeps going on to, to some details. Now, he also looks at the question of who should be doing this education. We'll see more of this uh, later, but he ties it into politics. Now, in Aristotle's time, when Aristotle was doing his Aristotle stuff, you have you know these various city states. You did have you know eventually like a Macedonian Empire, etc. And the Greek city states, which you'd be familiar with, <clears throat> they were much more autonomous than cities would be today. Although in the United States, cities do enjoy quite a bit of autonomy. You know, they would have mayors and councils, etc. And a Greek city state would have uh, even more autonomy. In fact, at you know some points in Greek history, they were literally states. You know, their own. Even though they had shared culture, etc., they were sort of like a country in the form of a city. So he thinks that in a good city state or you know situation with a good government, the people passing and making the laws would make the citizens good by habituation. And he believes that what a legislature should do, a lawmaker should do if they're good, is try to make citizens good. Now it doesn't mean like fake a good, you know, virtue signaling and lying about what is good. He believes in objective ethics. So he believes that this is not just like propaganda, you know, and political games. He thinks that since he believes in objective ethics, the function of the state is to make people good and not like in a, again, like a um, fake way or, you know, it turns out they're actually evil pretending to be good. Aristotle seems to have really believed, you know, morality is objective and doing a proper job as a lawmaker is to make people objectively good. That, of course, can be debated. You might not believe there's objective goodness, but he, he believed that. And so he thinks that a good constitution of a state, a good set of laws, would aim at making people good, and a bad one would not. So how, you know, laying aside the thing about like having the government, you know, make you good, and it, it would be reasonable to have suspicions of, you know, most governments uh, today and throughout history, at an individual level, how, what would you be doing to become good? As I noted before, he draws an analogy to uh, crafts, you know, but, you know, the arts and the sciences, etc. And he believes that the way you become good at something is essentially in the same manner that you become bad at it. So if it takes, you know, playing guitar, you become a good guitar player by playing guitar. Uh, but the other side of that, of course, is you way you become a bad guitar player is by playing guitar badly. And he applies this to you know all other uh, skill sets, builders, craftspeople, etc. And this, you know, if any time uh, one has developed a skill or developed a, a skill badly, this seems to match up with that. He seems to be right. Like if you learned how to say draw or do electrical work or plumbing or surgery or something, it's by doing it, that you become good at it or bad at it. And he claims this is how it works because otherwise there'd be no need to teach people. People would just be born good or bad. And he thinks people are born neutral. So the model for learning virtues, he believes, is the same as the model of learning any skill, that it's how we behave. And then we develop these, these qualities through our actions. It's like training for sports. You want to be a better runner, run. You want to be, you know, a better uh, baseball player, play baseball. So in the case of virtues, it's how we behave in dealing with other people that would make us just if we behave justly or unjust if we behave badly. The way we face danger makes us either brave, we face it with courage, or cowardly, we you know, face it with a lack of courage and flee. So these activities, the way we act, produces our dispositions. We become what we repeatedly do. And he hit on something that has proven correct and has been you know, focused on by advertisers and political people and cult leaders, etc., which is uh, getting people when they're young informing their habits. And that makes all the difference in the world, for good or for bad. 
This is something Aristotle noticed and Plato noticed long ago. And it's something, you know, companies who have you know products they want to sell like tobacco, they, they try, of course, to hurt people when they're young because that forms our habits. The political groups, et cetera, you know, like the Nazis famously, for example, uh, religions for good or for bad, of course, want to get people early because that shapes uh, how people develop. That's not to say people can't change, but our early years tend to shape us the most. Aristotle, as I know, we talked about his virtue theory. He believes in objective morality. So it's not relative. It's not a matter of opinion. He's aware that people disagree about it. But if someone, if people you know, disagree, at least one of them would be you know, wrong. However, he doesn't think that morality is an exact science. That because of this, you can't give exact rules. You can't say, you know, always do this, always, always, always. Uh, because ethics for him is not theoretical, but rather a practical science. And what you have to focus on is general rules, which in a way are not, are not focused, and then you have to figure out how to apply them in particular circumstances. And this could create the appearance that ethics is kind of, you know, not objective, but it's more that ethics falls into particular circumstances, more contextual as opposed to relative. So it's not that morality is just relative or subjective. It's that a lot depends on the circumstances. Also, despite his obvious concern with, you know, philosophy and, and that, uh, you know, the more theoretical aspects, he sees ethics as, again, a very practical science. So even though it's a branch of philosophy, he claims it's not theoretical. Now, obviously today we're now doing like lots of ethical theory and we talked about you know, the approaches to ethical uh, education. But he takes it as, a again, a, a very practical thing because the point of it, he, he believes, is not, not to know goodness. I mean, that's part of it. The goal, the ultimate sort of end is to become good. And he thinks otherwise it would be useless. And one could draw, he doesn't do this, but one could draw an analogy to something like driver's ed. If you went to a driver's ed course, you know, back in junior high or high school or whenever, and they talked about, they began by talking about, say, the development of oil, the development of petroleum, the development of the internal combustion engine, you know, theories about, you know, wheels and, and traffic and automobile design, and you never got behind the wheel to drive. I mean, the class may be interesting theoretically about automotive and engineering theory, but of course, as a driver's ed class, it would be useless you would want to learn to drive. And Aristotle looks at moral education in a similar way, that the goal is not, the, the end goal is not learning various theories, but to learn to become good and become good. So his assumption, a critical assumption he makes is this, we should act according to right principle, and he makes that as an assumption, now, something he's not going to argue for. And making assumptions, of course, is a fair move in philosophy, sciences, etc., because you got to begin somewhere. Otherwise, you're often in an infinite regress where you have to have to argue or prove everything, and then you'd never get started. So we have this notion of um, he has this notion of this general rules. So why the general rules, and what might they be, etc. Well, as we sort of looked at before. He believes that ethics is not an exact science, but it's still an objective science. And so the best we can do is provide an outline and not precise detail. Because questions about conduct, expedience, etc., are analogous to what is, you know, helpful, like things about exercise, diet, etc. And of course, we have general rules about exercise and diet and so on, like you shouldn't eat too much, you shouldn't eat too little, you should get enough water, you should get the right nutrients, you should do the same with exercise, not too much, but not because you'll get hurt, uh, not too little because you won't you know, have the, the health developments. And so there are sort of these outlines of it. But of course, what you should eat specifically and what someone else should eat could be you know quite different in terms of you know, what do you, you know, what's your focus? Are you doing, suppose someone's doing like a high intensity 
you know, strength building, weightlifting focus, well, lots more protein. If someone's focused on heavy endurance training for the marathon, and they need protein, of course, but, you know, more carbohydrates. It also, of course, their training would be different. So if someone wanted to build like lots of muscle mass, marathon training would not be, be very useful. And if someone wanted to run a marathon, doing, spending their days, you know, lifting weights, you know, heavy weights for hours and not running would not be very useful. So we have general outlines for health in terms of diet, exercise, etc., And then we have to look at particular situations. And so he, he believes the same applies to ethics, that what you have to do is you have to, just like with health, you have to look at the particulars of the situation and you have to um, adjust things based on the particular context. <clears throat> now, we wouldn't think that diet was subjective or, you know, that whatever someone thinks is healthy is healthy or that exercise is subjective. Uh, it's an objective matter. You know, if one wants to build build endurance, um, then cardio is a good way to do that. If one wants to build strength, then things like weightlifting, resistance training would, would do that. If someone wants to avoid scurvy, you know, vitamin C, those types of things. But the particulars of it, you know, developing, say, a particular diet plan or exercise plan, that would have to be to be effective or very effective, have to be very particular. And so he likes his analogies to medicine, uh, navigation, and similar things. But he does have a cardinal rule, of, hence a picture of the cardinal, of, you know, an essential or foundational rule, which is that whole thing we saw with virtue theory, this idea of the mean, that right conduct is incompatible with excess or deficiency in feelings and actions. So it's a Goldilocks thing. I you know, mentioned before, knew not too much, not too little, but it has to be just right. And that's the challenge. What is the just right? So he has another analogy as well. Not surprisingly, you know, philosopher, we like, we like analogies. So this analogy is to health. This would be, you know, things involving, you know, exercise, eating, drinking, uh, rest, etc. And he claims that just like health, moral qualities would be, you know, developed or destroyed depending on, you know, whether you have too much, too little, or just right. So too little is harmful. You know, if you don't get enough food, enough nutrients, that's bad. Not enough exercise, that's bad. But too much, you know, too much food or even too much of nutrients. For example, we need iron uh, to, you know, to survive, you know, use, you know, mainly in our blood to carry oxygen. But too much iron is actually poisonous and can be be harmful. In fact, it's one of the uh, common ways uh, that children get poisoned is over, you know, overexposure to iron. And of course, exercise too little is bad and too much can be really, actually really bad, more, you know, injuries, exhaustion, etc. And so you have to have the right amount. And Aristotle, you know, is drawing this, this comparison. Okay, how do you get healthier? Well, you get the right amount, not too much, not too little of exercise, food, drink, etc. And he thinks the same applies to the virtues. So if someone has an excess of fear, too much fear, they're a coward. If someone has too little fear, they become foolhardy and they're both bad. The coward, you know, flees from things they shouldn't flee from. They're scared. But someone who's afraid of nothing, they end up, uh, can end up in, you know, being injured or killed because they don't have a good sense of danger. If someone abstains from every pleasure, he thinks that would be bad. And if someone gives in to every pleasure, that would be bad as well. So all our qualities, he, he thinks, like courage and generosity, they're destroyed by excess, too much, and deficiency, too little, and they're preserved by the means. Uh, you know, the, this middle ground, again, Goldilocks. So in terms of developing our virtues, again, this is the sort of uh, self-help or self-improvement advice. So how would you develop your virtues if you wanted to do so? And his answer essentially is you exercise them by doing the same things that give rise to them. 
also, as you noted before, things like, you know, playing guitar, etc. You become a good guitar player by playing guitar, but you also can become a very bad one by playing guitar badly. So we have, we be, we develop our virtues by doing things. And of course we harm them by doing things as well. So we have to figure out what, what should we do? Now, again, his general advice is true, but obviously pretty vague, you know, not too much, not too little, but just right. And he draws another analogy to, again, to, you know, strength and health. So the way you develop physical strength, and the Greeks knew this, um, you know, long ago, so this is not like a modern finding, is from plenty of nourishment and severe training. And if you're already strong, you can best carry out, you know, strength training. Just like if you have good endurance, you can best carry out endurance training. And so in the case of the virtues, he believes you do a similar thing. It's like, you know, strength training or endurance training, etc. So you would do training. So suppose you want to become temperate. You want to, you know, not too, not too much, but not too little. Well, what you do typically is we tend to give in more, you know, more to pleasures, you know, overeating, you know, watching too much YouTube or spending too much time on Facebook, Instagram, etc. And the way one develops these qualities is by doing them. So if a person wants to be, you know, temperate and restrained, they refrain from pleasures. And of course, someone who has these qualities, it's easier for them to do this. So as we get better, it becomes easier, just like, you know, with sports. If you, you know, ever took up like running or weightlifting or, you know, doing any sorts of sports or activities, if you just go from, you know, they have a you know, program, I think it's like couch to 5k or something. If you go from like zero fitness, it's, it's tough. It, you know, it's, it's just being able to do say a half a mile can be, you know, can be challenging. But then once training begins, then it becomes easier. You know, mile becomes easy then two miles, three miles. If you really stick with it, you know, you can, you can be doing, you know, 10 miles, 20 miles. And if you really, really stick with it, you might end up doing those, you know, hundred mile races. In the case of things like bravery, uh, by successfully, you know, facing things that are scary, we develop our bravery. And the more brave we become, the easier it becomes. And this, of course, leads us to the question of, so how do you know when you're making progress? And we'll turn to next, uh, and since it's getting, getting a bit long, we'll split this into two videos. So in the next video, we'll start by looking at how do you measure the progress? So stay virtuous, stay safe, and I'll see you in the future.